if we can call to order it. We'll call it. Uh, first and foremost, it's um, odd times. Currently, I would suggest that people who are having to make anybody in the town who's having to make the adjustments to uh, this uh, current and intermittent way of doing things uh, to participate in our meeting. We've got our website and on FCAT if you want to clock in. Uh, and I would say to those people who are uh, working through a difficult period, uh, remember your uh, personal and social networks and remember that the uh, town services are still running. EMS is on and running. Town office is on and running. Please don't come and visit, but we're still doing things that you expect us to do on a daily basis. Uh, that includes things like town meeting prep, that includes things like uh, uh, ballot preparation, that includes things like dog licenses because they're coming up, that includes things like correspondence with legislators. Um, and remember that this part of your social network is still working for you. So we've called to order. We've got a handful of things to do tonight. Uh, emergency, state of emergency update. There's a topical discussion about the budget. Our revenue numbers are coming together. Uh, select board updates, town administrator updates. All of it seems a little in the ether right now as we speak from different rooms, but I hear having uh, watched our last uh, meeting in this format that FCAT, to their great credit, uh, is keeping us honest and keeping you informed. So that said, any comments from any of the other board members? Nope, I'm, uh, I'm good right now. Thank you. I'll start, Mr. Chair. Okay, so let's start with uh, a minute, March 23rd. That was our first ether. <laughs> I'll make a motion on the very <laughs> thorough minutes. Second. Very good. Thanks so much. And as we did last time, some visible sign <clears throat> that we are participating. All those in favor of approving the minutes, aye. Aye. I actually loved FCAT, the whole Hollywood Squares format when I saw this broadcast on Sunday. I was trying to pick out my favorite. From that. We got more than squares now, Scott. What's that? We got more than squares right now. Oh, yeah. Much more I don't think you could take a circle for a block. <laughs> Great point. Um, so next up uh, be the 2000, I'm sorry, will be the state of emergency update. Uh, our town still is operating under the state of emergency. The governor has extended before in place and maybe our EMD folks can uh, weigh in as to what those impacts would be for uh, members of the community. And I see Fire Chief Steve sitting there and out there in the ether is our EMD, I hope. Yep, she's here. How are you? Hey. How are you? Good, how are you? Any particular updates? Um, we've worked out a schematic for the um, public health nurse to update me when there's a confirmed case of COVID in Sunderland, and then I will update the police chief and fire chief as necessary. Uh, the public health nurse will also update Shelburne mm -hmm. Control so they're aware when dispatches are made. Um, other than that, um, we received a delivery from the Department of Public Health of some much needed PPE. We received some face shields and some gloves. We're still awaiting a delivery of respirators and thermometers. Um, I attended a webinar today to become familiar with how to apply for federal disaster assistance grants. Now that Massachusetts has been declared a major disaster, um, there's a lot more availability in grants. But no, no paperwork, all right up. Oh yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I had to. <laughs> yeah, I know. Lots of paperwork. Chief, you want to weigh in on anything? Sure. 
Uh, Lori's done a great job of interfacing with MEMA and uh, getting us the tools that we need for, uh, for working on this. We've been pretty blessed as the uh, fire department. Uh, South County is doing a fabulous job of taking over um, a lot of the frontline medical uh, medical calls, medical runs, they've been pretty busy. It's going to increase probably for the next few weeks. Uh, it's just a fact of what we're dealing with. Uh, but right now, they seem to be doing pretty well. Uh, as far as the fire department's concerned, we're still operating per normal. We're exercising a couple new protocols uh, for fire-related issues. We're not um, standing close to each other on scene. We're keeping our distance from residents and bystanders, things of that nature. Sometimes we've got to uh, got to remind folks about what we're doing because they're used to having firefighters up close and personal and uh, talking with us, but everybody's been very respectful to that. And when we're dealing with uh, anything that is medical related, we've got our, uh, you might say, emergency standard operating procedures that we're following. Uh, there's a laundry list of recommendations from uh, Department of Public Health, as well as FEMA and MEMA, in terms of how to best use that personal protecting protection equipment, so we're not um, using it unnecessarily. There is only enough of it to go around. Um, we're set for with a standard response and um, projecting out there. We could handle probably twenty to thirty medical calls for assistance with the equipment that we've got. Um, provided we can only have one or two people attending to the patient and helping out South County. So we're in, uh, we're in good shape. Our business continues with the exception of inspections. If anybody is selling a home, the uh, governor has put in place a waiver of the 26F and 26F and a half inspections. And what that ultimately means is prior to selling a house, the fire department usually comes in, make sure that your smoke detectors and carbon monoxide detectors are up to current code. And uh, what's happened is the governor has waived that need for the inspection up to 90 days after the state of emergency ends. So anyone that sells a home now, we will not necessarily come and do an inspection now, but we will do it once the state of emergency is over and you'll still be obligated to bring the systems in the house up to current code. Got it. So looking at this in a in a, a retro a retro inspection. Exactly. Just in the interest of keeping everybody separate and uh, letting things die down, as they say. Makes perfect sense. EMD, I didn't mean to chop off and head off to the fire chief. He's on video, and and you come up as EMD. Uh, is there anything else you needed to add or wanted to add? Nope. Um, anything else you need from me? Uh, yeah, Lori, this yes. is Tom. Hi, Tom. Um, a, a couple things. When when we use our PPE, do do we actually train the people on how to use the uh, the PPE, such as you know gloves? I mean, everybody thinks they know how to put gloves on until you actually are tasked with removing your gloves. So do we do we actually give trainings, Jeff? And I, and again, I know it's silly, but. I've, I've, seen I've seen people try to take off gloves and they can't take off gloves without getting more contamination. And I'm just for worried the, that people would have a false sense of security about that. For the fire department, absolutely. Um, we, we drill on that a lot. And I don't know about the police, but I assume they've had first responder training. And during that reach training, they would know how to don and doff their gear. Okay, could you check on that? Would, would you just ask them if you have a chance, please? Yep. The other thing, the other one for uh, Fire Chief, Steve, uh, earlier today we had a, uh, a, a teleconference with, with uh, Conway Whiteley in Deerfield, and we talked about we a few years ago, part of our emergency uh, preparedness thing, we did uh, drive-by or drive-through uh, um, flu clinics and such. And that's probably going to be happening again um, they're going to try to get this year's flu shots out earlier. And one of the things where they are talking about is um, bad weather or such. Could you look at what it would take um, to have the drive-through through the uh, equipment bays of the fire station? And, and 
you know, maybe moving our trucks over to the highway garage and, and, and putting, you know, so that they're in a heated area, if it would happen to be a cold time, could you look at that? And we, we may want to put that plan in our book so we could run that plan. Sure. Um, there wouldn't be much looking, looking into it, Tom. We could certainly do that. Uh, the building is set up so we could turn the heat off if it's really cold. We wouldn't be wasting a lot of heat, but people would still be out of the elements. And we could uh, certainly move things out of the way, put the trucks in a safe spot. So just let me know when and we can make it happen. Thank you, Steve. Thank you, Mr. Chair. David, anything else? Uh, no, I'm good. Thank you. Jeff, anything you want to weigh in on the state of emergency update? Anything you've participated in since our last meeting that we need to convey to the public? Um, I was also on the emergency dispensing site call uh, with Tom this morning. Um, I think it's good to start preparing for that now. I think it's, it's smart um, and to do it regionally. Um, I, I wanted to check, Lori, did we, um, I know we'd reached out to UMass to see if there was any uh, additional gear and, and we sent them a list. Did they ever get back to us? He did. Um, he called me. He said they've given away most of what they had, but he was expecting some more Tyvek suits and gloves. And if he was able to procure those, he would let me know and we'd set up a delivery. Okay. Um, I did want to mention that originally when we declared the state of emergency, we sort of anticipated that we'd revisit um, the possibility that town buildings would be open this week. And I think that now that we have a better grasp on the situation, um, I think it's important for the public to know that they will continue to, as we've said, be operating for staff, but not open to the public. Um, but I just thought it would be important to reiterate that. And um, I, I would like uh, the Board of Health Chair, if she wants to, I think she has some good news that she wants to share. So I don't want to steal her thunder. Oh, with um, the money? Or, yes. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah. All right. So um, we got a grant. Um, for uh, some, uh, we got an emergency grant that is covering the extra cost it's co costing for our public health nurse to uh, monitor the MAVEN system, that's M-A-V-E-N, and the MAVEN system is the state, um, basically state computer system that is logging, that logs all uh, infectious diseases in our state and it logs it by town. And in this case, what we're really watching, I mean, it's still logging any infectious disease, but obviously in this case, it's logging our COVID-19 uh, cases. Um, and uh, so we are paying our contracted public health nurse um, considerably more money uh, during this uh, crisis. Um, she's basically, monitoring the system. She is then, um, we, we came up with a protocol, as uh, Lori mentioned, um, to notify everybody in a, a pretty efficient, timely manner uh, of the, uh, any positive cases in our town, not only for um, notifying basically our, our our town officials and the people in our town, but also our first responders. Um, we are very careful um, and uh, extremely um, uh, conscientious about people's privacy and HIPAA and following the law. Um, no um, information, name information or sex information or anything personal about anyone who has uh, any of uh, has tested positive um, gets reported, however, um, to our first responders. Uh, however, we, we do try to get out um, to 
the uh, the first responders information to keep them safe while uh, while responding to any calls at a, a residence that is um, that there's a positive test that comes in either through the state that maven system or public health nurses often get uh, diagnosed positive tests now they are not the clinical tests, but they are say a doctor diagnoses someone and the public health nurse would also get that. And that would come in through email or for, through a phone call say. Um, and that information would then go through the protocol just as if it came in through our MAVEN system uh, with our town being um, tagged. I also today spoke with um, Butch Garrity who is the, um, the director of the uh, emergency services up at Shelburne Control. And uh, he gave me a little bit of background on what they do with the information they get. Um, and what they do is uh, they'll, they'll just put a street address in. Um, so if a call comes in, a 911 call comes in, it'll get tagged, but no information about the person or the residents there will go out to the first responders, only that there's a possibility. So first responders need to exercise caution um, as far as uh, PPEs uh, when they respond to those addresses. Um, so, oh, we'll get back to the money because that's the good part. Um, so we got our first disbursement and we got an email today saying that a second disbursement is coming through. Um, Jeff, I, I, you know, I read the email right before we got on the conference, this conference call. It, it's supposed to come through pretty quickly. Either, did you get the same email? I did not. I think I uh, I got one that said we got 3,500 and I think that was the first, right? That was the first, but no, I got an email today saying this, uh, there's a second and it's coming through within days. That's great. No, I didn't get that, but that's, that's great. Congratulations. So what I did was I put in for town, the town nurse. I also put in for personal protective equipment and I tried to throw in as much as I could when I, they, they literally gave me hours to to put this together um so i i i called everybody i knew i, I called well, actually steve i didn't call you i'm very sorry about that <laughs> but i did call okay. uh, the chief he um i called um the police chief but he he did include you <laughs> um, when we were talking about the personal protective equipment okay. and um but i got an email back saying that goes through and lori probably knows this they said that that funding stream goes through another source so they denied that part of it. So they only are including for my and the Board of Health, the town nurse. Um, the only other thing we have in town that's going on regarding this is um, we have uh, some private construction sites that are, um, that are still working and they are able to be working and they are following uh, the governor's protocols. Um, they've been checked on several times. <laughs> and uh, what we are gonna do, we, I was gonna call a, an emergency board of health meeting, but our board of health members are actually volunteer, um, you know, elected officials. And we've all been pretty stressed to the limit at this point. <laughs> So I'm going to wait because, and I'll tell you basically because those con construction sites are following what they're supposed to be doing. If they weren't, I would immediately call an emergency board of health meeting, adopt the, um, adopt the governor's uh, code of uh, what private construction sites or what public construction sites are supposed to be following so that it would apply to the private construction sites in our town um, and, and do it immediately. But what we're doing right now is we're monitoring the construction sites in our town. Uh, we have a, a very large one. They are doing what they're supposed to be doing. They are practicing very good 
um, social distancing and public health policy while on site. So um, we're monitoring that. And um, at the next Board of Health, we will be adopting all regulations to our town so that everything applies um, to private as well as public construction sites. I think that's about it with relating to specifically COVID-19 issues and Board of Health. Great. Thanks so much for the update. I really appreciate it. Not just the, the quality of the information, but also the, the amount of work that goes into it. I've seen the email exchange. I, I, I understand the complexities and I appreciate the fact that the Board of Health is, is just rocking it for the residents. Oh, well, we appreciate that. <laughs> Mr. Chair, if I may. Oh, um, sorry. One, one, one question that I've heard, and Caitlin did a great job of explaining the process for when we're notified of somebody in town that's been confirmed positive with the virus. But a lot of people are wondering, well, why, why do people need to know don't firefighters and EMTs take the same precautions? But because the PPE supply is somewhat constricted, there are thresholds to what type of PPE the responders are wearing. So if they just get a call for somebody that's having flu-like symptoms, they'd probably have, let's just call it mid-range PPE. If somebody gets called for a broken leg, that's a completely different type of PPE. But if somebody is confirmed at that address to have um, the COVID virus, the EMTs will probably wear the full face shields, perhaps some of the N95 masks, uh, even a gown. And the reason for that is that stuff can't be used twice. So they don't want to squander it. And they're using their best judgment based on the information they have as to how to, uh, how to use up that equipment. So that's why there's that information sharing going on. So Steve, you, you described that all as basically situational. Well, exactly. And um, this is the, the, the fire and EMS business and police is situational to start with, but this just adds a whole other layer of concern because you don't want to use up the stuff. Um, they can give out grants all day long for PPE, but the constriction is in the supply chain. And uh, um, there isn't quite enough of that to go around. So they're trying to be careful with it. Great point. Uh, board members, you want to weigh in on this or anything else? Oh, I, I'd just like to thank everybody and you're all doing a great job and keep it up and hopefully it'll all end soon. Thanks. Okay. Uh, so next up for us, outside of those updates, uh, it's important to stay in touch with uh, mass.gov, any of those um, information blasts that come out, uh, we'll make sure to continue to send links through our own website. That's important to bear in mind. And in the old school format, listen to your radio every now and then, especially the local ones. There's a lot of information that's flowing out there that's quality information used to connect people with concerns to information that could help them. So. Mr. Chair, if I could please. Go ahead. If what I would also recommend is not not getting your news from just one source. Um, oh yeah, yeah, great point. I, I I would I would go again. I would go on the CDC website. Um, if you want, if, if you hear something and and you before you hear something and act on something, I would I would highly recommend you go on the CDC website and and research the information there and or the John Hopkins Johns yep. Hopkins website. They also have a very good very good one or the Mayo Clinic has also all. So, and again, we have to do our best job um, by, by, by thinking and, and understanding and, and research and come up with good solutions and, and good practice. And, all, and also Mr. Chair, just remember, I mean, don't get disheartened right now when you see the numbers where they are that we've been we've been kind of going through this for over almost two weeks now. Don't don't become disheartened by the numbers if they're not coming down. Because what we're, we're trying to do, what they've said all along in public health industry, is that they want to flatten the curve, and that's what hopefully we're going to do. We don't we don't want to keep skyrocketing exponentially 
with the numbers of cases that's coming in. So let's just keep doing what we're asked to do right now. Be smart. Uh, look at the numbers with with a with a keen eye, and that and that is that we weren't going to solve the problem overnight. It's just going to take a little. It's going to take some time, and and don't be disheartened if you don't see that number at zero. Great point, Tom. As quickly as the brakes can be applied, it takes a little bit of time to turn things back on. Well, we're an oil tanker right now, Scott. That's exactly right. Okay, so next up, a little bit very top end discussion about the FY21 budget. And the only news that we've got coming in from that budget, the expense requests have been sent in. And uh, over the last week, uh, Department of Local Services and DOR sent us our, our um, free cash certification. And that free cash certification is 510000 and. 0.093, so $510,093, which is pretty darn close to what we'd expect to have for uh, free cash based on leaving last year's eight plus million dollar budget. Any comments? We'll plug that into the revenue sheet and then start really refining the revenue pieces going uh, over the next uh, week or so. Good. Okay. Uh, so Jeff, if we could, you and I and uh, or you and a member of the board and accountant and treasure collector can get on one of these calls and we'll do our free cash. How did we get that free cash discussion and for last year and then begin plugging in uh, projected revenue so we can look forward to the other side of the budget. And we'll do that over the next week. Is that all right? Yep. Okay, so send that note to Brian and, and uh, we'll take it from there. Okay, uh, next up, uh, we did a draft annual town meeting warrant articles. We did by acceptance, I'm sorry, inclusion votes last week. Our warrant is built and a warrant, I guess the question I have, because they tie together, uh, is about uh, extending the date for annual town meeting and the annual election. I say that because the annual town meeting warrant is currently open. And as it continues to be open, you can accept you know, articles coming in. Uh, is there interest in closing the warrant as we see it right now? The only piece that could come forward, I see would be emergency spending, but that'd be under the declaration of emergency and could easily cast into FY21's budget cycle. Am I understanding that correct, Jeff? Yes. Um, there is legislation that they think uh, did not see that it got passed today, but I'm hearing that, that the legislature is confident they'd pass it tonight that would um, allow spending into the next fiscal year of no less than one twelfth of the previous year's fiscal budget and it would be month to month. That makes sense. So there, the legislation helps create a system to simply uh, pay as you go based on the prior year's budget. Yes. Those is 12, 12 month increments. I'm sorry, 12% yep. increments. Yep. And I did um, reach out to the treasurer collector and we've just started reviewing because things don't, our, our costs aren't evenly spread out over 12 months. Some months are more expensive. We have more things due. So we've started looking at that so that we don't just say, oh, what was one twelfth of the budget last year and feel like we're good and then actually wind up in a hole um, to actually project out what we might, what we might be needing. Good point. Uh, could, I, could I pull the board members to see if there's appetite for sending a note to department heads to keep spending at as low as possible a value going through the remainder of this year. I say that we know we have a declared emergency, but you know, we don't, we don't, Steve, Steve doesn't need to run out and buy a helicopter. Yeah. He already did. Yeah. Oh, he did. <laughs> sorry. Sorry. The warrants in the box. Uh, yeah. <laughs> so, but, but, but that said the day to day spending to keep the town in, um, not just good stead, but serving serving its electorate, serving the populace, 
should be, you know, really tight right now. I know it sounds counterintuitive, but if we're going to go month to month and extend our budget cycle, the question becomes, well, what kind of, what kind of spending approach do we take outside of the declaration of emergency? That's not PPE. That's not those kinds of things. Not we overtime. could all go for more grants. Yeah, that's a fair point. Yep. Good point, Caitlin. I appreciate that. Anyway, so we, we can talk about that going into our next meeting. If there's a letter that we want to have sent out from the board to department heads specifically. Yeah, I think it's probably a good idea. Mr. Mr. Chair, I would just recommend that our town administrator send out a letter to the to the uh, department heads and, and explain the financial mm -hmm. situation right now. Yeah, I, 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 I think that's that's well with his well within his job. You know, I, I think he's he's here. I, I, I'm pretty sure he's hearing the board say that uh, there is a concern about what we spend for money and, and looking forward. So I'm sure, I'm sure Jeff could draft draft something up for that. Yep. What do you think, Jeff? I could absolutely do that. Great. OK, thanks so much. Uh, so uh, with respect to warrant articles, we drafted for inclusion. And again, I wanted to piggyback this discussion because our warrant is currently open. Today is the last day for ballot question inclusion. Uh, there was a conference call with uh, KP Laud and uh, a whole bunch of people around uh, elections. And Jeff, did you hear anything from the town clerk specific to that? And I, my question is around postponement of an election. You know, we do elections by bylaw in that even in a declared emergency, must have a mechanism to postpone an election. Yes. So there was legislation passed this week um, allowing us to postpone the election. Uh, the clerk was on that call as well. Um, essentially, the select board can take a vote to postpone uh, the election up to June 30th. Um, you can postpone it to a specific date if that's known at this time. You can also take a vote to postpone it and determine the date at a later time. Um, given the election schedule and the fact that the ballot has to be posted um, or publicly available 20 days before the last date that you would be able to do that it would be um, June 10th for a June 30th election. Um, and if the clerk wants to add anything or correct anything that I said. Interesting. So uh, prerogative of the board with respect to postponing town meeting and postponing the annual election. It's important to bear in mind the annual election, there is no, there are no ballot questions on the ballot currently. It does not look like we have a budget, although Jeff, when you and I were talking a week ago, that you know, quarter of a million dollar hole, well, there it is. I see it on the revenue sheet. So well, welcome to Sunderland. <laughs> um, uh, but no contested elections, no ballot questions on the ballot. Our annual town meeting is usually that last, last Friday there in April. And the question becomes, is it the prerogative of the board to postpone those two? And if so, what dates? And I'm thinking that it might make sense to push this to like, consideration of the first week of June. And that would be the Friday the 5th. Well, Scott, what, Scott, maybe uh, Wendy, town clerk, you have uh, comments on that? Have you done a look at that? I, I have, I've talked to Jeff today that hey. those things sound fine. Um, even given the June 5th date, we certainly um, are going to push absentee and early ballots um, decreasing polling hours to four hours, um, like an eight to 12, so that we have minimal people going through the polling area for the safety of um, both the election workers and the voters. Um, I tried really hard to get a drive through um, election, but they weren't comfortable with the voting machine outside, so 
that 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 was a no go. But I think that would have been the healthiest for all involved. Can um, we still order fries? Uh, <laughs> No, because there will be no bake sale or anything. Gosh, I didn't. Um, but so that so the the goal though is because it is um, an extremely low turnout ballot. By that meaning, no um, ballot questions, no contested races. Um, our past history is fifty to a hundred voters on those specific ballots. So. Um, you know, we're not, not expecting a lot, but we certainly want to push the early voting and the absentee voting so that uh, we are not coming in contact with um, people and they're not coming in contact with us. So, so Tom Clark, can I just ask one question? Sure. Um, when, when you say that you want to do uh, early voting, absentee voting, that's going to be bringing a lot of people into your office though, isn't it? Uh, no, it would be, it would be done um, through the mail. Okay. So uh, you can make the request through the mail or yes. online? Yeah, there will be no um, polling um, area set up in my office at all. Like, like before. So you, you do everything from your office. I mean, it's through the mail. Okay. More, yeah, more like an absentee ballot from somebody out of town. Oh, that makes sense. I, I was just, I was just worried that we'd be bringing everybody into your office. So, yeah, no, no not that I was not. worried about you. Yeah. yeah, I didn't think so. <laughs> but um, we would be increasing postage, um, but people would still be able to drop off their ballots in the drop-off box um, to the right of the front door of the town offices. Yeah. So if that was a, a concern, uh, okay. right now I have one more filing date on Wednesday, a withdrawal date for nomination papers, which we have for the board of health position. Um, and then I will be able to order the appropriate ballots for this election. So, so question, Wendy, can, can you limit the hours to one hour? If you had to? Um, no, um, I don't set the hours. Uh, the select board set the hours, but in the minimum amount of hours is four. It's four, and okay. That, and and you, can, you can't go later than noon. Well, yeah. you can't start later than noon. Right, that makes sense. I would be suggesting yep. eight to noon, only because our voters like to vote earlier in the day. So you recommended June 5th? Eight to June twelve. Six. Uh, June. I believe it's June six, eight to noon. June right. six, eight to twelve. Okay. Yep, that's correct. Uh, yep. Now, for for the town meeting, is that the is that the board of, the, the board that that does that, or is that the uh, the moderator? I think either you have three choices um, on the on the town meeting. On um, the moderator can do it. You can do it. Um, I think Jeff has all that information on that. Um, you can kind of do one of the things is keep it for that date and then postpone like we did during a winter day. Yeah, yeah. We went in and did that. Um, and I think Jeff and I talked about that, um, about the easiest pot way to that I think we thought to do it and you can go ahead and let them know Jeff because that's more your and the moderators deal. Yeah so we, we spoke with the moderator. Um, with the moderator there's a little bit more involved uh, than with a select board vote he would have to declare that there is an emergency. I think there would need to be um, a letter from I think the health agent confirm to, to the state confirming that there is an emergency not that I think it would be hard to do and I think it can only be postponed for 30 days if the moderator does it um, the select board can do it uh, again with a vote um, on a date uh, certain um, to another date and no further action would be need to be taken 
Um, we thought that it would probably be easier to get information out to residents if we knew what that date was um, so that we could send them a mailing. Uh, typically in the next two weeks, the postcard would, would be mailed out to residents notifying them when the uh, town meeting was and when the election is. If we know that it's delayed to a date certain, we can say, don't show up on the last Friday because it's not happening, but here's when we plan on having it. Um, and, and the same with the election. So we could have one communication early on that uh, residents would be aware of. And then obviously continually to communicate that, you know, during these meetings online um, to eliminate as much confusion as possible and get as much turnout as, as we can. So would we be looking at like the 5th of June then based on like past tradition? So we have it the Friday, you know, or essentially the day before the election? Is that the that, date we're kind of thinking about? That's what the moderator and uh, the clerk and I were discussing today um, okay. as, as an option. But um, obviously I hadn't had a conversation with all of you and your availability, but uh, the clerk and the moderator were both available on, on the fifth and sixth for town meeting in the election. Yeah, that seems prudent. Any more discussion on changing the dates? It sounds like there's consensus from the people who really run those two events. It is the moderator's meeting and it is the clerk's election. So if they're in, they're in agreement that those dates would be uh, acceptable and in keeping in the air quotes tradition, having our annual town meeting on a Friday evening and then subsequently the election the Saturday, uh, hopefully with that kind of lead time, June 5th and June 6th now, pushing it out 60 days or so, would, um, would the board entertain those dates? And if so, is there a motion? Yes, I'd, uh, I'll make a motion to adjust the town meeting date to Friday the 5th of June and followed up by the town election on Saturday the 6th of June. Second. We have a motion made and seconded. Do you want to keep our regular times? I heard the clerk say that this is motion made and seconded. Now just some discussion uh, from the chair's position. Uh, we have the clerk saying setting election hours 8 to 12. Correct. Yes. Yep. I, I would include that. Yep. And then our regular town meeting hours have been 7 p.m. on Correct. Friday. Yep. I think it makes sense to keep the regular town meeting hours. Okay. I appreciate the discussion. So there's a motion made and seconded to set the annual town meeting for June 5th, 7 p.m. at the elementary school. And then the annual election, June 6th, 8 a.m. to 12 p uh, noon. Uh, and that would be at the library in one fashion or another. Mr. All Chair, those in favor? Did you want to include loca typical locations for both as well? Yeah, I thought I thought in the elementary school for the fifth and then oh, the library. Sorry. Oh, it's okay. I was, was I self muting? No, I <laughs> yeah. got it. So yeah. So uh, elementary school, June 5th, 7 PM annual town meeting, and then uh, library Sunderland uh, public library, June 6th, 8 AM to 12 noon for the election. Any and more just uh, Scott, if I could just add, um, because of the change in dates, the, we will have to do two warrants, an election warrant and a town meeting warrant. They won't be able to run off the same because uh, the last day to register to vote, that's the only thing that hasn't changed in the election schedule is the last day to register to vote, which would be 10 days before the election. Okay. And, um, it will still be the same 20 day for the town meeting. So two, two, elect, uh, two warrants. Okay, so when we see those warrants, um, uh, town clerk, as we see those warrants, we have an ATM warrant in front of us. We'll change those dates, right? And yeah, we have at the end of that, you'll see the election yep. warrant, which is always included. We'll just separate that out. Got it. 
Very good. Thanks so much for the, for the clarification. I appreciate that. And Jeff, we can work on cutting those pieces apart now. That being the two warrants. Yep. Great. Okay. Any other discussion on the motion that's made and seconded? And thanks, uh, Wendy, for weighing in on that. Not hearing any more discussion. All those in favor of changing the dates as mentioned, I'll signify by saying aye. Aye. Three, okay. Uh, next up, some select board updates. Tom, you were in call today. Um, okay. Um, first, the uh, senior center, um, the first day um, last week when we started uh, pick up meals, we were at 12 or 13, and today we did 36. So we had a robocall that went out the other day. And again, for, for those that didn't get the robocall, um, if, if you are in need of lunch, uh, you can call the senior center, talk to Christina, um, and order, you need to order two days in advance, or you could do, you could do, just tell us you'd like all five days because we are now running meals Monday through Friday and, and she'll make arrangements. So if you're, if you're 60 and over and you want a meal, you can uh, call Christina at the senior center. Um, if you can't get there, let her know. And that we have, we will, we will get, we have volunteers that'll help deliver uh, the food also. Um, so the program is working and, and also if you get uh, lunch, the uh, Frontier uh, Regionals also is part of their program. They're offering lunch, uh, breakfast, so they'll, they'll actually put in breakfast for the next day as well. So you get a uh, breakfast for, you get a breakfast and a lunch. So it's a, it's a, a, it's a good way to start thinking. The, uh, the thing, um, again, I'd like to, to, um, Reemphasize is that we need to follow, um, and it's tough. Trust me, it's very tough. But it, we need to to follow the the, the protocols. Um, wash your hands. Um, I, you know, many people now have red hands um, from washing so often, and they dry it out. Um, but wash your hands. Maintain social distancing. It's a little frustrating for us. And we go to great, great pains, even our meeting here, go on Zoom, and then you watch um, people doing press conferences and everybody standing shoulder to shoulder. Um, but we, we, we think it's a good idea that, you know, we're asking, we're asking, we're part of asking people to maintain, maintain the protocols. We think it's important that we have to set a good example also, and that's why we're on Zoom, and that's why we have all the people online here also. Caitlin, I would like to uh, thank you for following up on the uh, on the Maven and and working with our our public health nurse right now. Um, that that was a, a a wise wise call by the uh, members of the uh, the board of health is having our the public health nurse to be talking to us, and 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 that gives you a, a tool that you, that you really haven't been able to fully utilize in the past. The other thing, Mr. Chair, is that one of the things that we had on a conversation this morning is that it's it's not happening yet, but um, everyone believes at some point we will be having to um, come together and run our um, emergency dispensing sites, either drive-through sites or um, many different forms that we have done in the past. So right now, if if you are available to volunteer, can you please call the town and, and or email the town with your name? You can either call, you know, the, the selectman's office, send the, uh, the, the select board a, a, uh, an email. But if you can volunteer, um, especially if you have any medical 
Um, Because one of the things that they had talked about in the past was that we use a lot of nursing students from GCC to do shots, uh, give shots. Um, And actually, they did a really nice job. But we, if you are a nurse um, or a PA or a doctor, and you you, you could you could help out um, to volunteer, be greatly appreciated. Because we figure if, if we won't have those students this time around, so if you have the uh, opportunity, please volunteer, um, and we'll get you the training and everything that needs to be done. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thanks so much, Tom. Uh, David, you want, before we plow into personnel committee, are there any updates outside of that you want to add? No, I think, I think that's it. We've kind of covered most of the stuff. So I'll just wait till we get down to that. Okay. So I've got a meeting tomorrow, uh, in this format with the regional school district about their budget and capital planning. So I look forward to participating in that from wherever it is I'm at. Um, they say we can we can dial in from anywhere, so who knows where I'll be. Uh, that said, uh, let's move on to town administrator updates. Yeah, so um, aside from COVID-19 response, which is a lot. Um, and, and <laughs> Welcome to your and first event. <laughs> believe me, this isn't, you know, I know that the Board of Health and, and fire and uh, police and EMS are probably doing a lot more than I am. Um, also trying to stay on top of a couple projects that are going on. Um, I spoke with um, Gina at RDI and uh, Laura from Valley CDC, Laura Baker, about the 120 North Main Street and just getting myself caught up so that the project can continue to move forward. Um, we'll be getting an update in June, but uh, DHCD was out there and just a, an outside inspection earlier this week. And um, they said that, that was very promising as far as uh, getting the state grants that we're looking for. Um, ah, good. I, That's good. Yeah. Um, so they said typically we hear about that in July or August, but this is anything but a typical year. So <laughs> not sure. Um, I was also on a call um, with members of the energy committee about uh, municipal aggregation earlier this week. And it looks like that is moving forward. Um, there seems to be a, a couple questions. I think eventually the board is going to decide whether or not um, Sunderland wants to participate in the municipal energy aggregation program. Right now it's looking like um, we have preliminary prices and I think they're talking about going out to bid in May once the uh, current electricity prices are known as well so that we can have a, a realistic comparison. Um, and it, that's a aggregation among 13 regional towns um, to purchase energy for a set period of time. Mr. Chair, Please. one thing, one thing uh, you know, we don't have on the thing, but I saw it came in, is the uh, 120 North Main Street, when Jeff talked about it, we had this, the tree study, the arborist presented his study. Mm -hmm. And I was wondering, Jeff, is there any way we can get that online so people could look at that? and that live along uh, North Main Street and they could see, because they went, they actually inventoried every tree along North Main Street and they rated every tree um, and what would happen to them with the, uh, with the construction and if it would have to be removed, if it would have to stay, not, you know, if it would be impacted or not. And people may, people may be very interested in the results of that survey. Yes, absolutely. So that's, uh, another thing, thank you for reminding me, the North Main Street reconstruction project, I also followed up with the designers. Um, there was a call, uh, I think it was late last week, um, with the uh, Franklin County TIP advisory group. Um, and so there's, 
I, I'm hopeful that, that maybe some of the things that the designers felt that they had to cut to come in under budget, there may have been a miscommunication about what actually the budget is and what they can spend. So um, I'm working with them in MassDOT to get more clarity on uh, exactly what MassDOT and, and the federal government will support through the TIP program and then um, what we what we might be have to come up with if we want to do the original 100% designs that were submitted in February. So I'm I'm still working on that and, and getting clarity, um, and we'll come back to you once that is clear um, to to move forward with those decisions. Hey Jeff. Yes. Good thing you're a nice little quiet town of Sunderland, huh? It must oh. be so much easier than when you're in Amherst. A lot going on. It's good. Keeping me busy. Um, I also, you know, we had uh, invited um, the principal of the elementary school, and I didn't know if you guys wanted to get an update from him as well about the things that the elementary school has been doing. Absolutely. Yeah, we can have him. Uh, he can call in on our next on our next meeting, and it makes perfect sense. He's on now. Oh, if you want to hear, on there, yeah. I just want to. Hey, how he's about in, this? He's in square number two A. <laughs> can can you hear me from across the river in Deerfield? Oh boy, you're gonna pay the tax just barely, <laughs> just barely. Um, so yeah, thanks for uh, letting me speak for a few minutes about where we're at on the school's end. Um, so uh, as you know, we learned on Friday, March 13th, that school would be off until April 7th. Um, during that time, we set up a remote learning platform for all students in grades K through six um, using the Google Apps for Education, Google Sites, Google Classrooms, and um, uh, Google Docs to uh, have correspondence back and forth between the teachers and the students. We provided packets to students as well. Uh, the first two days that school um, had the different format, our primary focus was providing um, food and devices for um, the families that were in need of that uh, service. So we contacted all families and lo have loaned out close to 50 devices or so for our elementary school community. Um, we've also done individual check-ins with our most vulnerable students and families. Um, and now the school closure has extended until May 1st with a possible return date of May 4th. And so during this time, we've received additional guidance from uh, both the state level and at the federal level um, in terms of providing support and services to our students. Uh, this coming Wednesday evening, we're holding a family informational session. In fact, we're holding three separate sessions, a pre-K, K, a grade one through three, and a grade four through six to um, allow uh, parents, uh, guardians, caregivers the opportunity to um, ask questions and provide feedback with how things are going um, at their house. Um, we know families are feeling overwhelmed uh, with this sudden change of schooling. Um, many of our families, parents are, are still working at this time, um, albeit remotely. Um, yet, uh, having to help a student in first or second grade is significantly different than um, having kids in middle school or high school who are a little bit more independent. So it's definitely a, um, a new experience for everyone involved, but I could not be more proud of the efforts of the Sunderland Elementary School faculty and staff for stepping up during this time and, and really trying to make um, a really tough, difficult situation as, as positive as possible for our, for our students. Um, additionally, teachers um, and related service providers have been ha holding Google Meet sessions, which is similar to the, to the Zoom format that we have tonight. Um, they're meeting individually with some students and small group and whole group with, with others. Mm -hmm. So it's really been a positive experience um, as much as it can be up to this point. So that's kind of the update on, on the school end. We, we are delivering, um, either delivering meals uh, daily or they're also available for pickup at the elementary school. 
Um, and next week it's going to be switching to Mondays, Wednesdays, and Fridays for the food service. Um, and the delivery on, on Monday would provide enough food for breakfast the following morning, lunch the following day, and then uh, the following breakfast as well. Um, uh, does the board have any questions for me? I would start by asking Ben, uh, are there any other uh, resources the town can provide uh, in helping the elementary school with these services? I, I would say not, not at this time. Um, it's really, we're, we're holding daily cohort meetings within the school, excuse me, uh, not daily, weekly cohort meetings. So I'll meet with a specialist, I'll meet with a special education team, I'll meet with grade one, two, and three, four, and five, six teachers. And, and really those discussions have been focusing on reaching out to our most vulnerable students. And each um, faculty member is kind of providing an update on their end um, on what they've been doing to support students and families. So from a, coming from the town, nothing at this point, but we definitely know where to, where to find you. Great, thanks for the fine work. Uh, questions of the board? And you don't need you don't need any more equipment or anything, do you? No, not not at this time. We've we've closed off the building, um, and in fact, and we've reduced hours as well for for all for like custodial staff and secretarial staff. So um, our, our secretary is doing as much work as as she can remotely. The custodians are coming in for a, a couple hours a day in the middle of the day, which is when the um, lunch services are happening. We are loaning out devices and um, handing out lunches outside of the school so that there's still minimal contact between um, the lunch providers and, and families. So you have enough computers, laptops, whatever to go out for everybody? Yeah, we've actually, we've been loaning out Chromebooks for students in grades three through six and iPads for students in grades K through two. There hasn't been as much of a need for the, um, for iPads to be loaned out or lent out. Um, but at this point, it's just with, with the older students. Um, and we've had pretty good success um, with the students in the upper grades connecting with their teachers uh, through the Google platform. Um, almost all students have been able to access that. Let us know, okay? Absolutely, thank you. Great. Thanks so much, Ben. I really appreciate that. Okay, so next up, uh, personnel committee recommendations. I see the letter here in front of me. And it looks like this is a March 26th date. And David, how did that meeting go? Was it a ton of fun? Oh, it was a blast. We we'll always have a lot of um, lively discussions in those meetings. Mm -hmm. um, but what we did, I'll just kind of break it down. We voted our annual COLA and the, I believe it came out using the calculation, it came out to just over 1%, I believe. And correct me if I'm wrong, Jeff, but I think it was a hair over 1%. So what we decided was to take the base and then add a little bit onto it to bring it up to 2% um, so that we could at least keep, because one of our concerns is, is that we want to periodically look at it and always at least use the formula as a basis and not lose sight of that, but maybe then do an add on if necessary to kind of keep it somewhat on par with what other union groups are getting. Um, so that this is some similarity and so that we don't keep falling behind because one of the concerns is let's say we've completed all of our, you know, what our salary adjustments. We want to make sure that we don't like, get where we want to be and then drift, start drifting back again too far. So, um, so we looked at that and we recommended a 2% COLA for that. Um, and that's actually still a little lower than all the other union groups are, are getting right now. So, um, <clears throat> and the estimated cost for that is $9,271 and four cents. And then the second thing was to vote to recommend for the, for the, all the, the employees that are covered by the personnel committee, and that's non-union, non-elected, um, and or ones that aren't specifically covered by a stipend, like the building inspector or um, the board of health. And <clears throat> and we've gone and went in and our goal, trying to meet our goal this year of getting everybody who's got um, five years and under to make sure we get all those people up to 
the, me the median of our, that peer group, and that's kind of our target. And that estimated cost for that is 25783 And then the next paragraph just covers which ones that we classify and get covered by the personnel committee. <clears throat> and then the last paragraph covers what we want to try to do for next year is to look at people who have had over, over five years and up around 10 years service. And we want to try to address those employees next year. Great. Uh, Tom, you want to weigh in on the note? Anything you want to jump out at you or? Um, no, I'm all set right now, Scott, for, for a second, Scotty. Okay. Dave and the personnel committee, thanks for that work. Jeff, anything you want to weigh in on with respect to the personnel committee recommendations? Nope. I think that the, um, David summed it up nicely. Um, you know, I, I guess one thing I would add is uh, through the Mass Municipal HR group, um, the personnel subcommittee did ask me to take a look at what other communities colas were for this year. And it seemed to range from a low end of about one and a half to a high end of about two, uh, three and a half. Um, but the vast majority were right around 2%. Okay. Thanks for that. And Dave, thanks for the work. I know this is, this is an annual, well, it's a, it's a project with an annual timeline. Is it not going it on? Is. It just goes on and rightly so. We're talking about compensation. Right. And act on uh, are the town's ability to afford said recommendation and the equity of said recommendation. That's really important to bear in mind. It's a, there's nothing less fun than talking about people's paychecks. That's very true. And, and we also, you know, I discussed too that, you know, there's still, as with everything in the budget this year and what's going on, there's a little unknown hanging over our heads. So that's a great point. And if, if, if anything symbolized by postponing annual town meeting and election, it's like, it's just a whole other world. <laughs> yeah, it is. Interesting. Okay. Well, thanks so much for that work. Um, so legislative update I have on here, uh, we keep getting, well, we are informed well from Senator Comerford's office, uh, as well as correspondence uh, from Representative Play. Uh, most of what is in our inbox right now is partly pending, and that's legislation centered around uh, town meeting, around the power of a moderator, the ability to change dates, uh, the ability to go into the coming year what would be a normal budget cycle ends as john june 31st and july 1st is the new one um so all of those are uh and acts to be addressed and i suspect the legislature is equally motivated uh to work with the towns as much as they are with the governor uh during this uh difficult time anyone want to weigh in with respect to legislative update Okay, uh, we have some homework and that's gonna be our motions. We have our draft annual town meeting warrant and that uh, move to include was completed at our last meeting. Uh, motions uh, framework, look like they're beginning to be drafted and are included, that can be our homework. I see in there, thanks Jeff, uh, for the inclusion of the CPA elements. I have a couple of questions if I could, since we're on that. On the subject of not so much the next park phase design, but on kayaks and shelters thereof, can I ask that uh, we take a look to see what the town's long-term liability is for another out structure, and then what our long-term liability would be for uh, support of that program, in particular, uh, centered around the fact that you're talking, the program is about loaning out uh, recreational equipment. And as that's probably the first time that ta this town's done it, in my recollection, I'd like to understand what those, what those, um, what the potential pitfalls are. How do we avoid getting into trouble? 
I will definitely look into that. And again, would, some, go ahead, David. No, sorry. I would say check with Catherine because she's done a lot of footwork on um, on this. Yep. Yes. Yep. So it should be a good. Uh, and she may have actually checked. I'm trying to remember some of the emails going back and forth because I've been to some of the meetings about the the kayak shelter and everything. And um, I think she may have checked on some of that stuff, but she'd be definitely a great place to start. Great. I think those are talking points that are going to be mm. important. You can get excited about mm. being able to go down, you know, school street and talk to the library and get a kayak for a day. You know, what happens if I end up over the Holyoke dam? Yeah, exactly. Yep. Not a place you want to be. No, not in the kayak. No. <laughs> okay. Any other discussion? There's no other discussion. I'll entertain a motion. So we're on next Monday, April 6th, because that's the way it is. And we're going to continue in this format. And I think this format, if there is feedback from the public about this format and ways to improve it, please contact our office. I want to thank FCAT for what they're doing on it. As I said, I watched a rebroadcast last week of our meeting. And it was interesting. I, did, I thought the information, which is the goal, uh, and to be conveyed was conveyed well. I thought that the interactions were as personable as they could possibly be. I want to thank <laughs> the chief, the EMD director, the town clerk, town administrator for you know, weighing in uh, remotely. Uh, and if anybody else wants to weigh in, you know, please contact us. Mr. Chair, if I could please. The, the, uh, we received a, uh, an email today from Senator Comfort about House Bill 4598. Right. Now, 4598 um, is in the legislators. What the legislators are trying to do is allow the town certain freedom. We, we, we're governed by, a, by many laws. And, and one of the laws that, that we govern is like, the board of selectmen can't just arbitrarily say, "Well, we're not going to we're not going to uh, collect demand charges on on late payments." That's right. actually that's governed by state law. So a lot of this is covered under forty five ninety eight that that allows us if if we have to spend money past June thirtieth, we could use our our um, um, free cash that we normally would never be able to do because mm -hmm. as of June 30th, technically that, that goes away. Um, the other thing is we could use um, stabilization to a lot, but it, what basically is our legislators are trying to make it so that we can continue to do business. And, and they are, and they, are and, and they, they, they do have in here um, a, a thing that allows the chief executive of city or town uh, or board to waive demands or payment of taxes. So mm -hmm. that's something we're gonna to have to be, we should pay a lot of attention to because it may help a lot of our residents pull through. Yeah, you had mentioned our last meeting, uh, last week's meeting, Tom, and it's nice to see that the senators sent us the legislation that includes that, and we'll see how it goes both with the House and with the governor. And you're right, this isn't an absolution of taxes. This is a way of postponing those <laughs> these in particular well and, and also in the uh, 4598 it extends the filing deadline for all tax returns and payments for the 2019 calendar year otherwise due on april 15th to july 15th 2020 correct now it hasn't happened yet but they're but it's working where they're going to extend the payments but that's in house bill 40 uh 4598 so I, I, if, if you listen to the news and you hear that, you may want to listen to that because there's a lot of things that may benefit. Great point. And let's hope, and again, thanks for Senator Comerford for keeping in her office, for keeping us with these email updates. They're there almost every other day these days. Okay, anything else? If not, is there a motion to adjourn? Uh, motion. Is there a second? Second. Motion is made and seconded to adjourn. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Three to zero, you can call.
Out at 7.42. Stay well, everyone.